morning and learn more about your word. We pray that we might dismiss anything that is of this world so that we might concentrate on our lessons and the sermon this morning. We thank you for the gospel meeting that we had last week. We're thankful for the good job that Brother Whittemore did. Pray that you will continue to bless him and his work. We pray that you will be with us this morning as we further worship you. We pray for those this morning that are sick. We pray that you will bless them and that they might re regain their health. Also, we pray for those that are lost. We pray that something might be said or done as we meet these people in our daily walks of life, that we might encourage them to come back. We pray that you'll be with us as we further worship you this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we welcome you this morning to our Bible study period. We're thankful for your presence and for the visitors who are with us today. We'll dismiss now with the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. middle school, high school, and adults. morning. Sound okay in the back if I, if I get this thing moved up enough? Okay, um, we have, we left off before the meeting and I, I, it kind of just fell with bad timing. I thought we'd get through that lesson, but we did not uh, quite make it. But we left off talking about the <clears throat> various figures of the Bible. Come on. Uh, we talked about uh, parable, and I, I forgot to take away the um, animations here, these that we've already covered. But remember, I did embed my font this time so you can see that combination of the Greek words there, para and balain. But the main thing I want to say here is just remember, a parable always contains one main lesson. Yes, ma'am. Um, prodigal son, uh, oh, oh, I see what you're asking. I was, I was about to say it's actually three, but it's in the context of three parables. You have the, uh, and, and Ronnie mentioned this the other night when he preached on it, there's the lost coin, there's the lost sheep, and then the lost son. Uh, it depends on who you ask. Um, well, it's definitely one parable. Right. It's definitely one parable. Um, people differ as to what the one main lesson there is. A lot of folks will say the one main lesson is, you know, the forgiveness of God with the son who came home. <clears throat> Other folks will say the actual lesson of that parable is the older son. He's the point because he's the Pharisees and, and the Jewish nation by and large. Uh, but do what? Yeah, and that's what, you know, well, it's, it's definitely three parables there because you, you have the, the coin that was lost. It was no fault of its own. It was, it was just lost, misplaced. Uh, and that shows God seeking sinners. You know, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10. Uh, the lost sheep is kind of a sheep, you know, the sheep just wanders astray. Oh, you're talking about within the prodigal son. Oh, I got you. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's, I think that's fair. It, it, it's, and of course, the overall, the overarching 
message there. I'm, I'm still of the opinion that the overall message is God's forgiveness. Because even in the midst of all his encounters with his enemies, Jesus is constantly trying to save them. And, and you know, he even says, um, you will not come to me. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. And he's, he's basically saying there, that's John 5, he's basically saying, I'm right here if you'll just come. I mean, you know, you guys are sitting here attacking me. You, you, you blaspheme me, but I'm right here. If you'll just come, you can have life. Uh, and I think that's the, the prodigal son. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm still upset with Ronnie because I was wanting to do a sermon on the older son. And now I've got to wait. <laughs> but uh, I had, I, you know, it wasn't that long ago I preached a sermon here on the prodigal son, um, and I remember I have some notes, and I'd have to find them anyways. But I have some notes from back when I was in preaching school, and I think it was Brother Kate's that did maybe a chapel sermon or something on the older son, and I took notes, and uh, I really, really liked that, and, and so I just kind of jotted down those notes and uh, wanted to develop it into a sermon, and then Ronnie went and preached that, so now I've got to wait for a little while. But uh, I don't know, maybe I should preach it sooner. That might, might tie in or something, I don't know. But anyway, um, <clears throat> but the main thing here is, is to remember that parables have one main lesson. Uh, people can pick a parable... Uh, apart and try to make it an allegory and when you do you run into problems because uh, you have you know in Luke 18 you have an unrighteous judge he doesn't fear God or man you know well is that supposed to be God you know is, is God unrighteous no it, the point of the parable is one main point and it's don't stop praying you know be constant in prayer that's the point there and so you know again remember one main lesson you're fine uh, one main lesson in a parable, and, and we, we, we looked at these couple of examples, and I, I just wanted to uh, reemphasize that. A fable, whoops, fable is the other one, we, next one we covered. Uh, Jotham's fable, is, is, this is not, in fact, beyond Jotham's fable, I'm trying to think if I can think of another one in the Bible. Uh, you, don't, you don't see fables a lot, but it's just a fictitious uh, narration, and that's the main difference between a parable and a fable. And you know, we all know Aesop's fables, you know, where they take, a lot of times it's trees or foxes, and they're talking and, and interacting as if they were human. Simile is, is comparison, and that contains the sign of comparison, like or as. Um, simile, sign, the S-I there, that's kind of how I try to remember that, although I still sometimes forget it, but like or as denotes a simile. Uh, the Spirit of God descending as a dove, you're likened to whited sepulchers. Uh, then you have similitude, which is just a drawn out. Uh, most of the time contains its own explanation. It's a drawn out simile. And I'm moving through these very quickly because we covered them last time. <clears throat> just wanted to review because we had the week of the gospel meeting. Metaphor is the, basically the same as a simile. It just doesn't have the sign of comparison. No like or as. You are the salt of the earth. He didn't say you're like salt of the earth, you, but he just says we are. Well, that's figurative language. We understand that. When people uh, people get, come to the Bible and they try to do all kind of crazy hermeneutical gymnastics when if they would just apply some common sense to how we talk in everyday life. Um, you know, we may say to a little kid, well, you're a little rascal. Well, you know, we may, that, that's figurative speech, you know. You may say you're, you're like something or whatever, but, you know, we, we get that in everyday life. Go tell that fox. What did poor Jesus think that Herod was a fox? He knew he was using a metaphor. <clears throat> and same thing with the Lord's Supper. We talked about a lot of false doctrine that has come up about the Lord's Supper because people just forget there or, or ignore that it's figurative language. Uh, then you have allegory, and this, is a, this has several points of analysis. And again, contrasted to the parable, which has one main point. But an allegory has several comparisons. Um, 
who among us that has been in the Lord's church for even a few years has not heard a sermon <clears throat> of contrast and comparison between the Old and the New Covenant? I have a sermon uh, back in the days before PowerPoint. When I was preaching in Centerville outside of Tuscaloosa, they had uh, PowerPoint was kind of starting to gain steam, but all they had there was a little overhead projector. Well, I managed to uh, print out a little... Uh, transparency and use the overhead projector and it just had columns. Uh, one column was the old covenant and over here to the right was the new covenant and we just contrasted various things. You know, the old covenant was temporary. The new covenant is forever. And You know, the old covenant was instituted with the blood of animals. New covenant instituted with the blood of Christ. On and on we could go, but you, you get the idea there. Several points of analysis as contrasted to the parable which has just the one. Hagar and Sarah is an interesting allegory there. In Galatians 4 on into verse, chapter 5, verse 1, and Paul actually says there, these things are an allegory. <clears throat> a parable is a supposed history. It didn't necessarily happen. Or in fact, it, nine times out of ten, it didn't happen. A parable is the story you make up. It could have happened, though. <clears throat> Whereas an allegory is taking something that really happened and saying, okay, here's an application of that. <clears throat> Metonymy, I think this is the one we did last when we ran out of time. <clears throat> it's, it's using one word or name for another. Now, you've got metonymy of the cause. We, we noticed several of these. There are several different kinds of metonymy, and, and it sounds, it's not a word that we use every day, but, but we use this figure of speech quite often in everyday life. Uh, metonymy of the cause is where the cause is put for the effect. <clears throat> you did not so learn Christ, Ephesians 4.20. Well, you did not so learn Christ's teaching. The effect of his teaching, the effect of Christ is his teaching, his doctrine. But he puts the name Christ there for that. <clears throat> um, try to think of an everyday example, you know. Uh, we often talk about scientists or mathematical people and maybe their theory. Uh, you know, we, we've been studying... Uh, you know, you may say in my, my science class, we've been studying Einstein. Well, have we really been studying him, or are we studying what he taught and what, you know, the theories and the proofs that he had and things like that? So, you know, we, again, we use these, uh, some of these we use quite frequently. Metonymy, the effect, is putting the effect for the cause, and that's where Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> then you've got metonymy of the subject. The subject is named, but a property or circumstance belonging to it is man. For God so loved the world. Well, he doesn't necessarily love the physical matter of this world. He loves human souls that he created in his own image. And, you know, again, we understand, you know, if I were to ask you, how do you know that God loves you? Well, you'd probably quote to me John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Well, I wouldn't be so foolish as to say, well, that doesn't mean God loves you. That just means he loves this world. It's figurative language, and it's, it's metonymy of the subject. Another example here it would do away with some of the um, binding ideas that people have about the Lord's Supper. Sometimes people say, well, we ought to have just one cup because it says he took the cup. Well, you don't drink a cup, folks. We understand that. You drink the, con the contents of the cup. So that's what it's talking about. That's just a simple, a simple understanding of figurative language in the Bible would do away with the idea that we must have one cup. Now, if somebody, if a congregation chooses to have one cup when they serve the Lord's Supper, that is their prerogative as an autonomous congregation of God's people. It's my prerogative to either sit on the very front row or to choose to go somewhere where they're going to use multiple cups because I don't want everybody's disease. You know, I, I suppose that'd be one way to move everybody up toward the front. People might be fighting for the front seat. But uh, what, when it gets to be a problem is when people say you have to use one cup. And if you don't, then you're sinning. It's just a misunderstanding of this uh, figure of speech called metonymy. And then you have metonymy, the adjunct, and this is where we left off. The subject is intended, <clears throat> but the adjunct is named. Circumcision, referring to the Jews. Uncircumcision, referring to the Gentiles. Romans chapter 3, verse 30. Uh, any questions on that? That's where we left off last, well, two weeks ago. Like I said, th these are not... Um, words necessarily that we use every day, and I've got some more of these handouts if anybody needs them uh, that have uh, these, these listed. <clears throat> and I've got another handout for you today uh, that I'll get to in just a moment.
I've, I've got, this will be one, two, three handouts that I've got on figures of speech because they're that important. And, and there's, there's so many of them that I don't want us to lose track of them and get confused. So I've actually got several of these. But figures of speech appear so frequently in Scripture that it's good to have a good handle on this before, before moving on. Uh, next is another figure of speech that, again, this is not a word that we use every day, but, but you'll, you'll recognize these things from many times in everyday speech. <clears throat> it's, it's the idea of speaking of the whole by a part or a part by using a term that denotes the whole. For example, here's a, an example of putting the whole for the part. There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, Luke 2, 1 says, that all the world should be taxed. So he sent ships over to America and Mexico and South America and taxed the whole world, right? Well, we understand it's talking about the Roman world. Caesar Augustus taxed his realm, his empire. Well, that's putting the whole for the party. The whole world should be taxed. We use this all the time in everyday speech. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of an example now. You know, it's one of those things where you... Uh, but, you know, we may talk about something, the, the whole world, such and such. Uh, you know, the whole world's doing this. Or we may even just say, you know, sometimes kids leave and say to their parents, everybody's going. Well, is everybody going? Or are you talking about everybody from your class, everybody from the youth group? W what are you talking about? So we understand that that's a figure of speech, putting the whole for the part. It's synecdoche. Then you can put sometimes a part for the whole. All the souls of the house of Jacob that went into Egypt were 70. Genesis 46, verse 27. Well, did just their souls go into Egypt and they left their body behind? Synecdoche. We understand that. Um, then you can also put time for part of time. They shall be your bondmen forever. Leviticus 25, verse 46. Well, is it literally forever and ever and ever? The Seventh-day Adventists misunderstand this many times in relation to the Sabbath law. And they say, well, you know, it says it's a law forever. But, you know, what I discovered, and I had a, a, a it was kind of, I, I won't know, if, I don't know if I'd say a Bible study, but I had a, a friend, he was a super, super nice guy. And uh, he, well, this was when we were in Chattanooga, and he, he wrote me when I had first come to Greens Lake Road, and I think it was an article I wrote that piqued his interest or something, and um, he, he took issue with me, he did it very gentlemanly and very respectfully, and it was just a super nice guy. But um, he and I wrote back and forth a few different times, and, um, but one of the things that he pointed out to me was that, you know, if you read about the Sabbath law, God says it's going to be a statute forever. And so I asked him, I said, well, what about the rest of the old law? What about sacrifices? We can't just cherry pick what we want out of the old law and leave what we don't like. What about sacrifices, the, you know, the burning of incense, the feasts, and so on and so forth? And he says, well, there's a distinction. There is the, uh, there's the ceremonial, and that was what was going to pass away. And then there's, you know, the moral, like the Ten Commandments, and that's, that was going to be a statute forever. But, first of all, first problem I found is that you cannot find in Scripture where there is a distinction. And, and what he would tell me was that when you read the term law of God, that's Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath day. And then he said when you read the term law of Moses or, or something of that effect, then that's the ceremonial that was going to pass away. But you can't, and without getting into a big extended discussion of that, Luke chapter 2, there's an example there when Jesus was born where they brought him and they offered, Mary and Joseph offered, the, and that, that's the ceremonial part he, he would say and, and, and I assume they would say as well. They offered for Jesus according to the law of God. Well, that's the ceremonial part that's supposed to pass away and according to him, law of God is the part that's not passing away, but that was the sacrifice and it's referred to as being part of the law of God. In fact, in that same passage in Luke 2, law of God and law of Moses are, are both used, and, and it's interchangeable terms. Second of all, in the Old Testament you don't find that either, by the way, but second of all, there's a passage, uh, for instance, in the book of Jonah, where Jonah says, as he's inside the belly of this great fish, 
and he's terrified and he's praying to God. He's, he's had some time to do some thinking. Uh, you know, being in the belly of a fish, I imagine, will get you to thinking. And so he starts deciding, you know, I, I should have probably listened to God. And so he starts praying to God and, and he's recounting what a traumatic experience that was. But he says, uh, the, the phrase there, it's, it's Jonah chapter 2 and I can't think of the exact verse, maybe 13 or so. But he says, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Now, how long was Jonah in the fish's belly? Well, three days and three nights. Uh, so, it, it wasn't forever, literally. So, sometimes forever is a, is a figurative term where time is put for part of time. And so, you see this from time to time in the Old Testament where something will say, it's going to be like this forever, and it means it's going to be for a long time. But you study Scripture as a whole, and you, you, you cannot miss, if, if we're studying it honestly and looking at what all the, taking all of what the Bible says, God's, the, the old law, the law of Moses, it was God's law, it was the law of Moses, those are interchangeable terms, but it was never meant to last forever. Paul deals with this so well in Galatians. It was a schoolmaster, as Paul puts it in Galatians, to bring us unto Christ. It's bringing us to the Messiah. It's, it's God's plan to usher in the Messiah, and when the Messiah comes, there's going to be a changing of the covenants, and we're going to receive a better covenant. And he, he deals with this in Hebrews, and how much better the covenant is. But um, any, anyway, there, there's a lot more that could be said about that, but I just want to mention that because this term forever. Sometimes people mistake that, and, some, and they forget... Again, about figurative speech. You know, we do this all the time in everyday life. You know, I went to Walmart today, and I had to wait in line forever. Well, how long were you in line? You know, it might have been just five, ten minutes. But it feels like forever when you're waiting in line, doesn't it? You know, we went to Six Flags today. Man, the lines were so long, we waited forever to get on that one ride. Figure of speech, synecdoche, putting time for part of a time. We use that all the time, but then we come to the Bible, and sometimes we just forget about figurative speech. Plural is put sometimes for the singular, that Sarah should have given children suck or should have nursed children. How many children did Sarah nurse? Genesis 21. Just one. Isaac. You know, sometimes people in the, in the Lord's church today get, get, I mean, I've seen people get adamantly opposed to brother so-and-so being an elder because he doesn't have but one child. And the Bible says an elder must have believing children. And that's a plural term, Brother Chad. Say, Come on now. If I get up, or whoever's doing the announcements gets up from the pulpit and says, um, after services, we need all the adults who have children to meet us down front. We've got to have a meeting. We want to talk about something with our youth program or our Bible class program. And then here sits somebody down in the back and you know, we're getting ready to have this meeting, and we say, uh, hey, brother so-and-so, you, you got kids? Come on down. And, oh, no, I just have one, and you said children. Well, we, we wouldn't do that. We know better. We understand figurative speech, and here's a biblical example that shows us that that's not necessarily talking about it's got to be that way. Uh, so that Sarah should have given children nurse or nursed children, plural being put for the singular, figure of speech. God will send the hornet among them. Here's the singular put for the plural. Um, God's not going to send one singular hornet. It's the idea of God sending uh, multiple helps for the children of Israel. And not, again, there's really kind of a double figurative use here because it's not talking about a literal hornet, obviously. But it's a figurative use for some of the help that God's going to provide for his people as they go and enter into the promised land and conquer it. And then I think there's one more, yeah. Here's where a definite number is put for an indefinite number. Matthew 18, 22. Jesus says to Peter, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And so, you know, you can just picture somebody running around to his brother and he says, well, I would love to forgive you. However, my records show this last time when you offended me was 490. And so, unfortunately, I cannot forgive you. Yeah, you know, we understand that is not what Jesus is saying He's not saying to go around and keep your, your tab of how many times you've forgiven your brother and if it reaches that number, you cut him off. The idea is indefinitely. It, it's, there's not a definite number in mind there because that's how God forgives us. God is not in heaven going, you know, 
Chad, do you know how many times you have struggled with this and you've come to me asking for forgiveness? Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm done. No, God doesn't do that. If we sincerely repent and come to him on his terms for forgiveness, he will forgive again and again and again and again. As long as we're sincere. Now, it's not a license just to keep doing the same things over and over again without trying. But let's face it, who hasn't been in a situation where you struggle with something and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit doing this, I'm going to do better, and then what happens? Maybe you, you trip up and you make that same mistake. Not because you were trying, but because you made a mistake. And you say, I messed up again. All right, I'm going to do better. Well, God forgives in those situations. So a definite number sometimes is put for an indefinite number. <clears throat> There's also a figure of speech called the proverb. I hope we all are familiar with that. It's a short, pithy sentence that contains a complete and valuable thought. A couple of examples here. <clears throat> it's more blessed to give than to receive. Jeff Archie did a lesson on that last night. Acts 20, verse 35. Well, that's a parable. I mean, a, a proverb. Uh, you know, it's just short, but it's, uh, it's the idea of something that is very short, but man, it packs some serious punch within that short statement. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I mean, you know, just a, such a short saying, but how often has that been quoted through the years by folks? Because there's so much wisdom in that. Ezekiel 18, too, uh, God says to the people of Israel through Ezekiel, his prophet, he says, you're no longer going to use this parable. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. What does that mean? You ever eaten sour grapes? Anybody? We used to do that. Oh, I see heads nodding now. Okay. We used to do that when I was a kid. We'd go out and get those sour grapes and just make fun of each other as we went, you know, just shake. Uh, when Joshua was just a little bitty baby, we would, we'd go to a restaurant and we, we'd just get water with a lemon. And that kid loved lemon. I don't know why, but he'd grab that lemon and he'd bite into it and we'd just get so tickled. I mean, he'd just sit there. And it looked like, it looked like, almost like he'd been punched. He'd snap back and shake his head. He was just a little old bitty baby. We... We'd do that so many times. We'd, we'd go out to eat with different people, and we'd say, watch this. Joshua, you want a lemon? And he'd say, and he'd take it, and, and sure enough, he'd just shake. Well, you know, if you ever eat sour grapes, man, they're sour. But, but they had this proverb, and they said, look, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, but they didn't shake with all that sour. It was the kids. Well, that's a ridiculous proverb, first of all, that, that anything would happen like that. But what the idea behind that proverb is that they were saying is that, you know, bless our hearts. You know, keep in mind, Ezekiel's in, he's among the captives in Babylon. He's prophesying. They're in captivity, the, the southern nation, the northern kingdom had already fallen. They're in captivity, and the, the younger generation is saying, well, you know, poor old us, our fathers, they sinned, they were idol worshiping, and, and here we are, we're just paying for it. And, and bless our hearts. We've just served God to the best of our ability, and, and all that's happening is we're just suffering for our father's sins. And Ezekiel says, no, you're sinful too. You're suffering because of your own sins. They were the ones. Now, in some cases, you have like Daniel. I mean, Daniel suffered right along with the nation, and Daniel was a righteous man. But these folks that were saying this, <clears throat> in that context, God's saying to them through Ezekiel, oh, no, you don't. You're not Mr. Innocent here. You brought this on yourselves. This is not a situation where the fathers ate sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. You have committed sin. In fact, in that context, he even says, Ezekiel 18, 20, we often quote this for people that try to say that children are born in sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. So, but that's a proverb. Basically, the entire book of Proverbs is, is filled with these little short uh, sentences that contain a complete, valuable thought. Uh, let's talk about irony. <clears throat> irony is saying one thing while you mean another. What's going on? <laughs> Did my battery go dead? Just, there we go. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a ridicule. It's many times designed to expose the faults of someone else. A um, couple of examples here. Elijah's taunts to the prophets of Baal. 1 Kings 18, 27. I mean, Elijah's sitting there, and of course, you know, he said, we're going to have this contest, and, you know, if Baal is God, then serve him by all means. But if Jehovah is God, then put away your idols and serve him. And so he says, let's just see. 
You prophets of Baal, get your sacrifice ready and call on Baal to consume this sacrifice. And then when you're done, I'll call on Jehovah and we'll find out who is truly the, the God. Well, they call and call and, of course, what happens? Not a thing. And, man, then they start wailing. You can just hear them. Come on, Baal, come on. And they start cutting themselves. Oh, they're, they're squalling and carrying on. You can almost see it like, you know, sometimes, and I, not to be disrespectful, but sometimes people today, I mean, they're rolling in the floor trying to get religion, as the expression goes. And I just, I don't ever want to make fun of somebody like that because, really, that is a pitiable state. And it's sad to me because if you want to, well, first of all, religion is not something that we get. It's something that we do, according to Scripture. But if you want to be saved, it's not about rolling and wallowing down on the ground and all that kind of stuff and carrying on and hollering. It's about going to the Bible, finding God's will and obeying it. But these prophets, I mean, they're cutting themselves, and, and it, it really is. It, it, again, it's a pitiable state. But Elijah's making a point here, and he says, uh, hey, hey, y'all, cry a little louder. Maybe he's hard of hearing. Maybe he doesn't quite hear you. Oh, maybe he's asleep. Yell a little louder. Wake him up. Maybe he's gone on a vacation, and that's why he's not answering your call. You get the idea. It's, it's irony, and he's making a point very strongly to show your God, supposed God, Baal, is no God at all. He's fake. He's an idol. He's nothing. And, of course, you know the rest of the story. They, Elijah prepares a sacrifice. They pour water all over it. And, again, remember, this is in a land where it hasn't rained for three and a half years, and they're dumping water like crazy. You think water was a precious commodity in those days? They dump water like crazy on it, fill the trench around it. Elijah calls on God how many times? Once. And immediately, fire from heaven comes, consumes the sacrifice, laps up the water, and it also consumes the altar. Everything's just burned up completely. Is it any wonder that the people cried out, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And it's not insignificant that they cried out, the Lord, he is the God. They understood it. And Elijah took those 400 wicked prophets of Baal and he killed them. But the taunts there would be in the category of irony. Acts 2.13, they're, they're taunting. They're not being serious when they say this. They're not, they don't seriously think Peter is drunk. In fact, the, the term, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to go back and look, but I believe in the Greek, the, the term that they use, new wine, is, is uh, I think it's glucose, which would basically be sugar water. These, these men are drunk on sugar water. You know, we, we sometimes say, somebody says something crazy, we might say, man, you're high on life. You ever say that to somebody? I had a friend that used to say that to me all the time. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's irony. Some, something's not right here. They knew these weren't. Uh, the kind of man that would be drinking alcohol, and say, man, they're full of new wine. And then you have sarcasm, which goes right with irony. This is uh, satirical, and it has a degree of contempt or scorn. It's stronger than irony, and it differs, as you see here, from irony in its severity and its spitefulness. Did I see a hand go up? I thought I saw somebody have a hand up. Um, here's an example. Matthew 27, 27. They, they bow the knee and they say, Hail, King of the Jews. What, did they mean that? No, it's a spiteful, hateful thing. And it's even more severe than irony. It's in the category of sarcasm. But you know what? Sometimes you even see godly people use this to make a pretty forceful point. Job 12, too. Job's been sitting around with his friends and they say, you know, they did pretty well. As one fellow said, I heard a preacher say this one time, said Job's friends did pretty well until they... So they opened their mouth. They sat with him for seven days in silence. And you know, sometimes that's the best thing we can do for somebody that's hurting, suffering physically, emotionally, whatever, is just sit there with them and be with them. Sometimes we do the most damage when we, when we open our mouths. But they were, I assume, had good intentions, but boy, did they go astray quickly. Job, what have you done? How about you just repent of this and everything will be just back like it was and you'll be wealthy and prosperous and, I mean, you've done something bad, brother. You, you need to make this right so that God will release you from his grip. Job says, I, I haven't done anything. I don't get the sense ever that Job claimed to be sinlessly perfect. But he says, I haven't, I haven't done anything. I haven't committed some great sin that this has come upon me for. 
Yes, you have, Job. Now stop it. You know, you, you, God's going to punish liars. So stop your lying and just make this right. You can see how frustrated Job gets. And in 12 too, he bursts out with, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. What, did he really think that when they died, wisdom was going to be gone? He's, he's being very sarcastic. You know, sometimes we may say to somebody, I'm picking up your sarcasm. <laughs> we, we use sarcasm a lot in our everyday lives. Paul even used it on one occasion. Um, I thought I had the reference there, and now I'm trying to remember where the occasion was. Uh, well, it might actually be in the category of irony, where in 2 Corinthians he says, being crafty, I caught you with guile. You know, people look at that sometimes and they say, why does Paul say that he caught them with guile being deceit? Why does Paul say that he caught them with deceit? So Paul's admitting to deceiving the brethren? No, it's irony, possibly even sarcasm. He's saying, oh, that's right. According to all of these people who are criticizing me and saying how I'm not truly an apostle and so on and so forth, I just tricked you, right? That's what he's saying. He's using sarcasm. And like I said, it may be more in the realm of irony. Sometimes there's a fine line between irony and sarcasm. But uh, he, he's, he's not saying there he used deceit to catch them, but he's kind of quoting what some of the people said about him and using it in a sarcastic way. Hyperbole is an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. For example, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, God told Abraham. Genesis 13, 16. Well, there have been a lot of Israelites. I don't know that they would number... Uh, as many as the dust of the earth. I mean, who could count that number, you know? But it, it's, it's not trying to make a literal number for number comparison there. It's an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. Deuteronomy 128. Man, those cities are great, walled up to heaven. Well, you reckon they had walls that reached all the way to heaven? I can guarantee you they didn't. It's an exaggeration. Uh, again, I went to Walmart today and I waited in line forever. Well, it's an exaggeration. That's hyperbole. Sometimes we say, man, did you see that car go by? He was, he was flying. Well, that's an exaggeration, hyperbole. Then there's apostrophe. You turn away from the real hearers and address imaginary ones. You see this a lot of times in, uh, for example, in Shakespeare. A lot of times like a soliloquy is kind of addressed to an imaginary hearer that is, is not even there. Sometimes he's turning to the audience. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Well, Paul's writing to the Corinthian brethren, and all of a sudden he starts talking to death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Well, that's apostrophe. And you learn this, by the way, in literature class. If you've ever had a literature class, this, a lot of these things are literary devices as well. Jesus starts talking to Jerusalem in Matthew 23, verse 37. Well, it's an imaginary you know, the city can't hear him, obviously. Same way the grave or death can't hear Paul. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 22, 29. You see this uh, figure of speech used quite a bit in Scripture. Then there's personification. Inanimate beings are spoken of as animate, and they're endowed with attributes of men. That's different from the apostrophe in that they, you give human attributes to inanimate objects. You're not just talking to them. Now they have human attributes. For example, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. Numbers 16, 31, and 32. Well, does the earth have a mouth? Well, it's personification. It's as if the earth had a mouth and just opened up and swallowed up Korah and all his rebellious gang. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 34, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. The morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Well, is tomorrow really going to be thinking about anything? I mean, it's it's not a person, it's not an animate object, but it's personification. So again, we use that from time to time as well. Then there's interrogation. It's to affirm or deny with great force. It's, not, it's no longer asking a question, but it's the end of the discussion. It's kind of like, you know, we use this a lot as well, especially if you're a parent and you have a young child. I may say, uh, do you want a spanking? Well, I, that's not a question that, you know, you really expect an answer to. Uh, although I did have a child say to me, um, Noah, it actually was not that long ago, since we moved here, I remember Reagan had gone somewhere and he did something and I said, do you want a spanking? And he said, mm-hmm. And I said, boy, did you hear me right? Do you want a spanking? And he says, mm-hmm. And I said, I'm going to ask you one more time, son. Do you want a spanking? And he says, mm-hmm. 
I thought, I'm going to stop that dog from sucking eggs. So I said, all right. And so I, gave, I didn't give him a hard one, but I gave him enough of a spanking that he, don't, he does not answer yes anymore to that question. I said, if you can ask for it, <laughs> ask and you shall receive, you know. But uh, it's not an inquiry into a proposition, but it's the end of it. Examples of this in Scripture would be Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 1. He says, am I not an apostle? Well, he's not asking for a yes or no question there. He's making a statement. I am an apostle. Am I not free? He's not asking. He's saying, I am free. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes. We sometimes call these rhetorical questions. It's kind of the same idea. Are not ye my work in the Lord? Well, yes, they are. Job 11, verse 7. Statement is made. Canst thou by searching find out God? The answer is no, obviously. Now, can you go and, and start a, a research study and at the end say, you know what, I've, 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 I'm ready to publish my findings in a book. I have exhausted the study of God. Never going to happen. Never in a million years. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a forceful question that drives home the point. that you Again, it's not an inquiry into a proposition, but the end of it. Is that the second bell? I thought it was. Man, I tried. Um, I've only got one sheet in my hand out here. Oh, we've got how many left? We got three left, and I ran out of time. I wanted to hand these out. Let me, uh, I'm going to put these up here on the front two pews. There's a quiz on each of these that I want you to do and, and bring this back, and we'll go over it next week. Um, one's a multiple choice. One is a matching type quiz. But the one that's multiple choice at the top you'll see there's definitions. So it's kind of your cheat sheet. But this is designed so that you can, when you're done, I think the printer was low on toner or something. We may need to run off a darker copy. But uh, when you're done with the quiz, you can cut off the top, and it should just about fit in your Bible. Maybe you might have to fold it in half. But that way you can keep these figures of speech handy and hopefully have them as a, a reference. But I, since we're out of time, I'm just going to set them on the front two pews. So everybody try to um, grab you a copy of that. Hey, Noah. Thank you very much. I may recruit a young man or two to hand some of these out to those folks that are not able to get around as easily. There we go. I'm going to give some of these to Joshua. You want to hand some out? If you want me to have somebody bring you one of these, just raise your hand. Brother Martin or one of my boys will bring them. Where are my boys? Joshua. Joshua.